everybody, Mo Bunnell here, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. This episode, I predict, is gonna be one of your favorites of all time because we've got a completely new voice, a completely new perspective. We've got completely new content that we've never, ever, ever covered before. So Aaron, I'm setting you up pretty big. What do you... <laughs> Anything to say about that? Yeah, you've made some big shoes for myself to fill. So I'll I'll try my best. (laughs) I think you will. I think you will. So Aaron, everybody, let me just credentialize Aaron because a lot of times we have somebody on the on the show and they've got a best-selling book or whatever. Aaron has a little different perspective. So what Aaron does is she runs the function within North America. Is that right, Aaron? America. Yep. At BCG, that is the entire function that supports all of their largest client relationships and their consultants and experts that are calling on those relationships. And all these people that report up to Aaron across all of North America, they're the people that are helping each of those client teams become effective. So if you have a client facing role, Aaron's gonna give you world-class tips today on how you can hold yourself accountable, how you can have the right habits, how you can track the right things from a systemic working with hundreds and hundreds of consultants kind of way. If you're a leader, she's going to show how to build out this functional area so your experts that are client facing get more leverage because I've just from my perspective, I've never seen anybody do it better than Aaron and her team across hundreds and hundreds of our clients. And also, if you happen to be a BD or marketing professional, you're going to be able to take tips that you can directly apply to your role in the folks that you support in your industry groups, your practice areas, or whoever that is. And I, let me say one more thing, Aaron, before you, like, I'm, you're going to blush after all this stuff. Aaron's doing us a favor here, everybody, because she's going to let us see behind the curtain a little bit and how to do this well in a way that isn't usually shared because she's always on the lookout for good talent. So the reason she's helping us out, audience, you're going to get so much out of this, is because she would love to meet people that might be good for these roles that we're going to be describing. We'll show you how to reach out to her later, but I just want to be really clear that usually you can't get this information and we're giving it to you because if we as a community can give Aaron a friend of yours or maybe you, yourself, whoever, if you know people that would be great for Aaron's team, she wants to meet them because she has the best I've ever seen on the planet. So Aaron, how about that for an intro? I love it. I love it. And the people focus is absolutely 100% right. Like they were only as good as the people that are that are on our team. And I have a fantastic team of folks here on my team, broader, broader BCG. Thrilled to be here. But I will say, Mo, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm such a huge fan of you, as you know, many of myself and my colleagues are. And we're all so passionate about growth. Like at the end of the day, that's what we are passionate about. Even if we are kind of the ones behind the scenes enabling others to sell and grow. We are passionate about growth. We're passionate about growing people. We're passionate about growing our clients. We're passionate about growing our our teams and our impact. So I can't imagine a better a better place to have this conversation. Yeah, I totally agree. And our audience is just going to love it. So let's dive right in. So when you think about like, when you think about that, well, why don't you describe the role for your team? Because I'd like to, I think that's good to hear from your perspective and then dovetail off of that and say, What's your big idea that you see that helps those people make an impact on the internal teams that are making an impact on the client? So Absolutely. maybe we start with the role. Yeah. So the role itself um, it is a dedicated thought partner to the largest accounts in the region. And so these folks can kind of sit at the intersection of you know the business services and the consulting teams where they are not the ones that are delivery partners. They're not delivery consultants but they are very embedded in those teams to understand the dynamics of the business, the team, and the actual clients that we're engaging and adding value to. They sit very much in that. In that. And the real you know, value that they provide to the team is to be a strategic thought partner who's focused exclusively on thinking about how to grow that client. So they wake up in the morning thinking about that one single client or maybe two single clients, and how we can continue to deliver more value, have more impact. Whereas if you think about some of the delivery partners with portfolios of of clients, they might be waking up thinking about six or seven. And so it's really the focus, the strategic creativity and thought process. And something that we'll talk about certainly a a lot uh, in our time today is the process, the systems, the organization, and the accountability. So really, how do you take the idea and the opportunity that you 
come up with whether yourself or whether with your team of, of delivery partners and actually make it happen, which I think is the, it's truly the magic of, of this. And I think that it dovetails a little bit into, into kind of the, the big idea, which probably is the new one. But I think, you know, most of your listeners, I imagine, Mo, most of the people that we work with are relationship selling. They're not selling, you know, a widget or a knickknack. They're, they're selling a service and it's based on relationship and trust. And so I think there is a bit of a, an idea that relationship selling is a soft skill, right? I have a good, good relationship with this person. We connect every now and then and voila, they have a project, they give it to me and we happily move forward. And I think that's, that's, that's not true, right? I think anybody who's done this for a long time knows that there is the hard skills of relationship selling and they're just as important, if not more important. Well, I think I, I totally agree. And let me comment on that. And this is a, get, talking to the audience and, and speaking from my perspective. I'm, I'm very authentic when I say Aaron and her team, I've seen deliver more value and be more effective this, than, in this role than anything I've ever seen at any firm. Ever. Hundreds and hundreds of professional service firms, service-based companies, where there's an advisor advising a client. And one of the things that I think is interesting, and I want to say this clearly because a lot of our audience because they might not have seen the value to the level Aaron, your team has has done, like I have, they're thinking of maybe somebody they tried in the past and it didn't work, or somebody they've got now, or or or, or the even sometimes the the BD professionals can get locked into being a bit more of a reactive party planner, if that makes sense. Yeah, that is not on. what we're talking about here. What's interesting about the the delivery side of the business is it's a little bit it's still open, but it's a mil, bit more of a closed game. We're, we're asked to deliver on these things by these dates and, and the consultants and the advisors at, at your, at, in your firm, everybody, audience, are working on that. Business development is massively an open game. And you know, what's going to win isn't beating the com- competition in a pitch. Of course, that's part of it. That's the very last thing if it even has to happen. The best opportunities are the ones we create ourselves. They're the ones that the, that we tell the client that they need us and show them through give to get audience or, or other investments we make in them. They're developing the relationship over the long game, staying in touch before they need us. Those are things where if you have this thought partner Aaron's thinking about, they're waking up. I love how you said it. they're waking up every morning, helping the team think of, hey, don't forget to check in with Suzanne. Hey, don't forget to send the first 90 days book to Philippe. He just got promoted. It's going to be super helpful. You might want to uh, schedule a lunch to talk it through too. Like having somebody internally that's helping you think of all those and hold you to account because of the open game nature and because of the high upside, the value is massive if you get it right. Erin, your thoughts? Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Mo. I think, you know, with these larger organizations too, but even even mid-sized organizations, there's so much IP happening at the center. And so in our organization, we have so much I mean, incredible thought leadership, incredible events, incredible, you know, experts. And the, you know, the delivery team, they're on the ground with their client as they should be. They should be the ones, you know, having the copies and having the impromptu chats and that sort of thing. But it's really hard to deliver. And then at the end of your 12-hour day, at the end of your four-day week, and you're on planes from here to there, think about what can I take from you know, the inside, my corporate center to really bring to the client in a creative way. And that's where having somebody who really sits at the intersection of, I'm not, I'm not there on the ground all the time, but what I am doing is I have a view of everything that our firm has to offer and bring to market. And not only can I say, hey, here's a great report, we should share it. It's here's a great piece of XYZ, report experts, et cetera. And I know who we can share it to. I know what point we can pull out. And I know the next steps to drive this into an active conversation, active narrative that maybe it turns into a piece of business in a month. Maybe it doesn't turn into a business piece of business in a year or at all ever. But it's it is the it is the how do we think about adding value to folks that are not that's outside of the project work. I love it. In in audience, think about the power you can unlock in your own life. A, if you have that thought be, like, partner. B, they're actually telling you not just, they're, they're not just holding you account or being that party planner, but they're actually saying, hey, I saw something. I think we ought to do the things like, like Aaron just said. And by the way, I drafted, a, I drafted a sample email that you can edit and I just shot it over to you a second ago. Like think of the leverage on your time you can get to not just because your day-to-day is thinking about doing the work, 
the leverage on winning the work is so powerful. It's both strategic, it's tactical, it's you can, there's metrics, you, you can track all those things. So Aaron, map it out for us. What are the, I think you've got sort of a framework you want to talk through. Let's talk about what it takes to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that uh, has infiltrated the DNA in our, our organization, well, thanks to you, is very much the HBDI framework, which is in, in L&D. But since going through master classes and training with you, I will be in conversations and people are using the HBDI language. This person, I think, is a, a blue. Like, how do we think about engaging them from a client perspective? Not just how do I think about teaming with my peers, important as well, but how do I think about the client? So I'm going to I'm going to take the spirit of, of the HBDI and kind of walk us through through the, the things that are important here. Right. Which are the, the yellow, the strategy, the strategic thinking, for sure, the the green the process, the organizations, the systems, the blue, which is, you know, the metrics, the logic, how are you deriving insights and, and what from? And then finally, my personal favorite is the people piece. You know, how do you influence essentially people, whether it's your teams, your clients, the people who you need to actually execute to go to go press hand on that email you were just talking about, Mo. So I think it's a it's an interesting, cool framework to to look at this topic with. So if I think about um, and just let me jump in, no, just if there's people that don't know, if you if you've been through our programs mm -hmm. and you know HBDI, you've read Snowball System, you've gone through the Grobig trading, you already you're like you're in love right away. If you don't if you don't know what that is, all you need to know is that HBDI is some IP owned by Herman International. It's absolutely fantastic, and it gives you a framework to deconstruct anything. And it was Aaron's idea to like put it to think through this role she's talking through these four lenses. And all you need to know is, is that these are the four major ways that people think. So to deconstruct a role, any role, this is a great example, into strategy, process, metrics, and people. Usually in organizations, there's one or two of those areas that aren't emphasized as much as they could. And by forcing yourself to equally spend time in each of the four, you can that, that alone is a lot of value. You could decode anything you're doing in those four ways. And as we do it, It'll be a great framework because we'll make sure that we hit all the high points that it takes to make this role successful. So, Aaron, back to you. I think you're going to start with strategy. Yeah, start, start at the top. Start with strategy. And this is the fun one, right? I think sometimes having a business development strategy might seem obvious. You have a sales goal. You might have an established relationship. You have a history of project work to lean on. And you can kind of move forward and say, I'm targeting X, X million. I, I know it's going to come from these three people and, and we'll push forward. But I think having a real planning process is critical and important. And what I'm not talking about here is having a template. And I think this is the, this is the, the danger, but also the distinction where planning, strategic planning, account planning, client planning, it's called a, several different things in different organizations. But if you over templatize it, it becomes an administrative burden. So the teams are going to think, oh, it's account planning time. I have to fill this out. I have to go have all of these conversations with stakeholders that don't really understand my business and I could be out in the market. And so I think the, the critical thing here is really having a process that's focused on conversation. And so, you know, I think if people lean into, okay, we have a meeting, we're going to have an account planning meeting, it's going to take place in XE around my client's budgeting time period of the year. And I'm going to pull together all this historical information, I'm going to pull together our historical revenue, our historical projects, our relationship map, and all of these things, which can be incredibly helpful for a discussion, don't get me wrong. But what the traps that I've been in the room for that I've facilitated myself and learn from are if you focus so much on what did we do, you're not doing the client any service. You're not doing yourself any service. It needs to be a discussion that is much more forward looking, that is much focused on what are my clients' needs. Let me take myself out of the picture for a second. And what are my clients' actual needs? And so I think the real, a real critical piece is, is having an objective-based agenda, thinking about some three strategic questions, we'll, we'll say. One, one is certainly reflecting on the relationship. You want to spend time to think about, you know, what have the client's major successes been? What have your major successes, to the team's major successes been with the client? How would you kind of calibrate the health of the relationship? Who do we know? Who do we not know? But then really shifting the conversation quickly to looking ahead and thinking about what are this client's primary opportunities and challenges as we think about the three month, the one year, the five year 
from their own perspective, right? Like as, as an independent client, but also with a real external lens focusing on, but what about the industry they're in? What about macroeconomic things? What about, you know, things like Gen AI? What's the impact to the going to be of, of these things? And then third, the third question being, you know, how do we, how do we help them address these things? Whether they're headwinds or tailwinds or opportunities, how do we do that? Which is really the planning phase. So I'm getting a little bit into the green, but I think, you know, in my experience, really drilling down and having that conversation is the right strategic conversation. It's not overly processed, not overly organized, but it's not moving into this dangerous space of like administrative red tape, got to check the box and then move on. Yeah. Aaron, I, I, you, as you talked about that, I have so much I want to come in, but I have to like figure out one thing because I want you to do most of the talking, but I've got a story and I think I've never shared this with you. I think you're going to die. There was a, like 15 years ago, we were working with a firm and they wanted us, the CEO asked, say, hey, can you sit in on a couple of our client planning sessions? We just want your feedback on how we're doing. I'm like, oh yeah, great. So the email was different 15 years ago. Like the amount of size of an attachment you can send is a little bit lower. But for the first client planning session, I get copied on the emails. Email comes in with, hey, here's the deck we're going to use for the client planning. Okay, great. That sounds great. It was so big, Aaron, they had to send it in two emails, part one, in part two, because it would it would, wouldn't get through their email system, and it had at least two hundred pages in the PowerPoint. I'm not joking. Oh. The only thing that was forward looking was the last page. It had, had a couple of vague, vague questions. Yes, so, yes. It's like this ninety minute meeting, and all they did was talk about the stuff they've done. I'm like, Here, here's my feedback. That is not client planning. Like we need to look <laughs> forward. Isn't that planning. crazy? Yeah, it is. And it's, it's totally unsurprising, too. It's like such an easy trap, right? Especially when you're in these organizations and people who are, who are very focused on like, what, how can we reflect on the past to learn about the future? And I think that's where the delicate, the delicate balance exists, right? But, you know, I also think with these, in these client planning sessions and really stri thinking strategically about clients, it's how do you take the time out of your day to day flow? to have the conversation, right? Um, which can be challenging. You have like the client fire over here, client over here. But I heard a story earlier this week that just really hit this point home for me, which was a team had a, a an account planning, client planning meeting, and it was on the books. Something big happened to the client. And they were like, we need to rethink this agenda. We need to use a big portion of it for this situation. We need all hands on deck for the situation. And they used that time to do that important but they did not take over one of the big and, and cool ideas, which I, which I love, that one of my colleagues came up with and others have adopted, which was we're still going to keep, you know, an hour or two hours on this shark tank where our team, our broader team of people who are on the ground at the client regularly, whether they're associates, consultants, project leaders, et cetera, they're going to come and they're going to bring their ideas for what is going to have an impact to the client. And they're going to pitch them. We're not going to give them too much guidance. We're not going to say fill out this this slide or whatever. We are just going to have them come and, and present to the team. And so it was, you know, they they were very committed to having that preserved. And I had a conversation with the leadership and and my colleague who serves on that account. And they were like, this was so valuable. We're so glad we didn't shift this. It focused the team on what's important at the client out of this, you know, our prior situation. It showed the team that as a leader, we're as leaders of this account, we're still committed to the sustainability and growth of the client and that we can carve out time to think strategically out of our day-to-day -to, -day to do this. Also, it built a ton of team morale, right? Everybody's sharing ideas. People were creative. Somebody was rapping. Like there was just so much going on in creativity that allowed people to shine through. And of course, you know, there were actually a couple of ideas that came out of the session that they can now bring to the client, right? And it wasn't a long time, a couple hours, but the important thing was they didn't drop it off. It's the easiest thing to drop off, but they didn't. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think jo jokes aside about what not to do, like don't focus on the past, but a pro tip around that, everybody talking back to the audience is shift your evaluation of what's happened to, to Slack, email, something like that. Like write it up. Hey, here's here's what we've done. Everybody review that before the meeting. That's what that's a massive pro tip because that can then shrink, say you've got an hour of client planning, that can shrink the the past part, air quotes for audio listeners, to 
that other mechanism, everybody review it beforehand, limit it to five minutes. Hey, any edits, okay, good, let's move on. And then you move to step two and three, what are the clients needs and how do we help? And I think that's powerful. The last thing I wanna say on that, Aaron, is the other pro tip I wanna give people is fall in love with the client's problems. It's a different way of saying what Aaron said, we're aligned here, but what is super easy to do in these sessions is to fall in love with our solutions. Hey, they need to buy X from us and they need to be Y, and that we usually have shorthanded lingo for what those kinds of products or services or offerings are. I don't want you to start, and Aaron doesn't want you to start there. We want you to start with what are the macro needs this client is needs in their, you know, given their existing situation now, and then hanging off of that, Aaron's words are so wise, how can we help them? That might involve you, it might make an introductions that don't involve you, but you want to really focus on their, fall in love with their problems and find ways to help as opposed to fall in love with our offerings and lingo and names. Aaron, agree? I totally, I totally agree. I think that's it. The, the pre-read is such a great practical tip. And I think that the falling in love with the client's problem is, is a great way of framing that. And I think another another really practical tip, because I love how folks come on your, your podcast and they're like, here's what you can do on a Tuesday. Just like, just at the beginning of the year or right now, just set aside like 90 minutes minimum every quarter, just put it on the calendar. It might move, it might shift, it might, you know, but it's there and it's holding you accountable. It's holding your team accountable. Um, and the trick is just, you know, getting it, getting it on the calendar. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing that can't happen in a week. So you really do have to set it out six weeks because you want the whole team there, all that. Yep. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect. So should we drop into your second of four big concepts? Yeah, let's do it. So you do, you're in a strategy meeting and you really have to have somebody there that's focused on what we'll call the green, right? Which is really the planning piece. So you can have big picture conversations, but there needs to then be the planning, the process, the organization. Otherwise, they're big pie in the sky ideas. I think what's an interesting thing about HBDI, my entire team took the HBDI assessment a couple of years ago. And again, these are folks that have been doing this type of business development work professionally for years. Some of them have had frontline sales roles themselves. They have MBAs. They've, you know, they're experienced folks. And so what really struck me, but also wasn't surprising, that the green was our was our top, our, our, our top cooperate with was the green. Now, everyone is very balanced. I'll say when we averaged the team out, it was kind of like a perfect square within the square, which, which made me feel good. But remarkably or unremarkably, the green was very pronounced. And I think in terms of, in terms of being, being a preference for our team, and that's what we do, right? Like ever, so people are taking this test in the context of what they do every day, but that really is, is where it comes in. The organization, the systems, the processes, you can have the best strategic plan, but if you don't have that kind of green discipline somewhere, it's not, it's really, you know, not going to, not going to go anywhere. And I think a couple of the, the three things, and you might have more to build on too, Mo, that I was thinking about are when it comes to organizing, like big picture, there's a lot of tools that we can, we can talk about anything, but really having cre clear roles and responsibilities among the team, whether it's related to who owns what campaign or who owns what topic or who owns what relationship, the cadence for meeting together. So how are we going to team together and what are the norms that accompany that? How do we exchange information? How transparent are we with information, which I think can be you know, a critical thing in some of these environments that, that we work in and, and with what your listeners work in. And then a shared body of information, which if I get really tactical is really, you know, does everyone have access to information about the client, the historical information, the, you know, proposal library, the relationship maps, the biographies, all of this, is that available in some place that's shared, whether it be a SharePoint site, C CRM, that sort of thing. But I think, you know, those are the three things for me that I think can make a really big difference having discipline around. I 100% agree. And again, it ties back to that idea of the, the entire team is spread like peanut butter across so many different delivery tasks. Maybe they're on other teams. They've got their internal roles. They've got everything yanking them away from doing these proactive, helpful business development tasks. So having this person at the center of the team where everybody has agreements in the meeting, like, yeah, Sue, we really do want you to follow up with us. Please nudge me. I'm committing to do this thing by this date. Having those agreements where 
the person who's helping managing the growth process itself, everybody agreeing in the meeting, yes, I want your help. I want your accountability. I want you to ping me a week before the things do to make sure. Having those agreements turns them from being a nag to being this helpful resources that's helping moving the team forward. A hundred percent. And I will say from my experience, you know, building and growing a team, the folks that are most successful in this type of role are those that are like, I'm, I see that value and I'm going to feel like I'm in trust. I actually feel like I'm bothering that person nonstop and that person, but they're relentless. And that person, the person that they're serving and they're kind of their teams are always like the most, the biggest value that this person brings beyond, beyond being a strategic thought partner. They do not let me drop the ball. Yeah. I love that. And it's getting everybody's agreement live that makes that, that unlocks that. Because if you don't have the discussion, like, Hey, you can just simply ask if you're in this role, everybody, Hey, I want, I actually want to think it's helpful to, to bug all of you around these What's the right way to do it? Everybody goes, oh, yeah, I pinged me a week before. Um, hey, can you share the to-do list transparently with everybody like we have it on Trello or Slack or an Excel file or a CRM or whatever? We, can you just, can, or is it okay if everybody, if we all see everybody's data? Yeah, that'd be fine. Could, could you, would it be helpful to send that out? I won't, I won't comment on anything. I'll just send out the data once a week at Friday at five and just, it'll show you if you've done the thing or not done the thing. Is that okay? Yeah, that'd be great. But there's mechanisms and agreements we can create of like transparently sharing data is one of the most powerful, getting the agreement that that's okay. And then the person in a role is like individually nudging people, team-based nudging people, all of that sort of helpful helps people do the hard thing that their year from now self will be happy they did. Aaron, is that what... What are your pro tips around that? I think that it'd be interesting from your perspective. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, what you just talked about are, are so many of the strategies that we use when you have folks that are, you know, they're engaged in other ways and they leave a call with a to-do list, but they might not have written it down. They might not have, you know, or your planning session and you have a slide where you've documented, you know, we're all going to do this to build our relationship with this really important executive, but they've moved on. And so it's really about, this permission, like you said, visibility and keeping it visible, using those forums, even, you know, okay, we have a standing 45 minute meeting every two weeks. I'm going to pull that up. I'm going to pull up the, the list live because it's, it's one thing to get it in your email. It's yeah, one yeah, all your on colleagues are right there like, oh, I'm the only one who didn't do the thing. <laughs> it's just like, you don't have to say anything. Air, air, screen, a color and red. It's, it's true. It can be really powerful. And there are other ways, right, that, you know, you can work with folks. I think our team finds a lot of leverage from teaming with executive assistants who manage the calendars of these folks. And like, how do you actually just say, okay, can you put like, this is going to be 30 minutes of this person's time. Copy and paste this email into there. They need to send it. Make sure that they do it. They are checking in with them periodically as well. So it's almost like, how can you do that? I, 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 and I think the, the persistence and knowing your, knowing the person you're working with, which is probably the same in any role. But I'll tell you an example for myself. Uh, yesterday, I was trying to get a hold of some someone to me, and we were coincidentally both in the in our, our our DC office. And I was talking to his EA, and I was like, what room is he going to be in? I'm texting him, and he's kind of in this closed-door negotiation. And I'm like, I'm going to sit outside of the room, and I'm going to make sure he gets this one really critically important thing done, and that I see him. And you know, it, we ended up meeting and, and being able to figure something out. But it really is the persistence and figuring out, like, how is this person going to respond? Now, you can't fly around the country to like make sure people do things in person all the time. But I do think that's it and really figuring out what is their what is their existing workflow? Again, like whether it be with your EAs, whether it be with others they work with, and how can you get into that to make sure that things yep. happen? No, I like the creativity of that too. Just to, uh, okay, I want to. I like to cover one more thing in the process or the green before we move yeah. on. And I'm I'm cognizant of time, but but there's, I think this is so important. One of the things that I've seen you and your teams do so well is be that strategic pro thought partner. What we've covered so far around process is more just event, you know, task management. Yeah. But it's so much more than that. So one of the things that I've just so relished and enjoyed working with your team is they have the same playbook that the that the consultants have. So what that means is like we might in step one, the strategic part of the conversation, we might think, wow, the client really needs help in this area and we have a major offering that might be able to help with them. But if we just go talk with an executive about what we do, that can fall flat. So we can get in, your team can get in a conversation and go, hey, we all practice give to gets. 
what's a half day workshop so we can immediately go into give to get because everybody's using the same playbook, you know, because we're, we're working with everybody. You can drop right into a technique to say, hey, what half day workshop should we could we offer on our dime that would be hugely beneficial to the client? They have a high likelihood they'd say yes, and it would likely expose them to the idea that this is a big unlock. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars and cost takeout or upside potential because there's a new offering or whatever. And then, then your team can be a thought par partner on actually structuring what that half day workshop looks like too. So just thoughts on that idea of not just task management, but breaking down a complex multi-month, maybe a year long BD process down to a tangible next step in helping think that through. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great example. I think, you know, when you come out of those meetings, you're like the opportunity at the client is, I don't know, I'll give Gen AI is such a buzzword, but it's like this Gen AI, Gen AI opportunity, right? And that's what you leave with. And you're like, well, what do we, what do we actually do here? What is the first step? How can I like break it down over, over the course of time? And how can I see it playing out? And, and that's where our team has a pretty structured process to think about, okay, what, what is, what are we hoping to get from this effort? Is it building relationship with this whole sole project? Is it both, et cetera? And what, what do we have internally that we can bring, whether it's experts? And they have very deep networks, which is really incredible and impressive in, in an organization of this size. And structuring that workshop to say, who should be in that workshop from the client? Who should be in that workshop from our side? Because it's not just the account team. It's going to be the experts. It could be another client that we don't serve, but that's doing this somewhere else. It might not be they're not doing it with us, but they might be doing it somewhere else. And we're bringing them. It could be like an alumni who we know is doing this in another kind of cool space. And so like if we think about what's going to really make this workshop worth those people's time, who are the right people in the room? And it might not always be the the cast of characters that was around the table when you're doing the account like me itself, right? And so really being thoughtful about that, researching people who are going to be around the table and thinking about, okay, if these are the people around the table, how do we structure this time? How do we leave time for, like, reserve time for content for sure? How do we leave time for discussion? So we're not sitting in a workshop flipping through slides for a half of a day, but we are having conversations and we're maybe showing them an actual experience and, and that sort of thing. So really structuring it so it's engaging and that it leads to the types of questions that will help us help them more. Yeah. Yeah. And the bow I want to put on that is when this role is effective, like I've seen you roll out with the team and, and continue to elevate the impact, is that the, the, the client-facing roles in your organization audience, I'm talking to you, whether you're a lawyer, a consultant, an accountant, an account manager to big healthcare company, you're a fractional business developer. So you've got a, like so much stuff is in your head. Well, having the right thought people in, person internally that is a full-time business development expert, they're, they're the, the, the expert in your corner saying, yeah, we, we want the client to buy this big thing nine months from now. What's the immediate thing that's very valuable and helpful we can offer next week? And how should that be designed? And how should we make the offer? Having somebody that's the expert in that is super helpful. And Aaron, that's what I've seen your team do super well around the process piece. No, I think that's right. And, and then one more idea to tag along that, it is that, and then it's the follow-up. Because again, it's so easy to leave that discussion and move on to the next meeting, or move on to the next go. And it's almost like we had this workshop, we heard all of these things. But what do we take from those? How do we discuss those as a team? And then what are the, what, what are the next steps? And continuming to follow through. Maybe it's not a workshop. Maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Maybe it's an introduction to this type of client. We're having this event next in a couple of months and it's a big industry event and we're doing a dinner beside it. We should see if we can get them invited and then invite them to a small round table dinner and, and think about how to foster that over time. Gold. It's absolutely gold. Okay. So we've, yeah. so we've covered strategy and the value there. We've covered process and the value there. Now it's time for our third thing, metrics run with it. Yes. So metrics, I think are fascinating, right? And in, in this or this world that we live in, there is so much data for all of us, right? We click on an email, it's data. We take an Uber ride from point A to B, point B, it's data. We say something aloud and our phone captured it and it's, it's now data. And so I think what's a really interesting and important to think about is how do you focus on data that gives you insights that are actionable to reduce some of the noise? Now, for 
everyone in general, but certainly the listeners of your of your podcast, having data driven recommendations, a focus on data is essential. I couldn't go into a meeting with a partner and say, I think we should do this just because I'm feeling that way when I woke up today. I have to have some type of data to back up why I'm recommending something, especially if there's a cost behind it, right? And so it's important in these environments to make sure that you do respect and focus on and derive insights from data. However, it can be really easy to get caught in almost a you know, analysis paralysis of the data sets itself and think about, oh, we have all of this data. We have all this supply of data. Like, I'm going to pull it all together and try and get a sense of the health of the business and what to do. And I think that can be really distracting because if you can't really identify two or three metrics that are going to be the ones that you focus on as a team, and it might be five or six, depending on what, what type of business you're, you're thinking about, but if you can't identify those and track those over time, derive insights that are going to make a difference that are actually actionable, then you're wasting your time. You're like doing a lot of internal stuff. And at the end of the day, your stakeholders, in, in my team's case, the internal partners, are going to be like, what have you been doing all of this time? And it's like, oh, I've been sorting through all of this data. But you get behind on actually making action. And so I think... For me, that's what I've observed over the past 10 years or so as the data has gotten so much richer in terms of availability. But it's really challenging if you try to focus and boil the ocean on every piece of data. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to dig deeper in this because the data that we see a lot of times is the revenue data. It's the lagging indicator. It's how many, if you're in a law firm, how many matters did we do with this client? What was the average size? What's the revenue we brought in? Maybe profitability, maybe billable hours, utilization. Those types of metrics are common in almost all professional service firms. Account managers for big clients, maybe healthcare companies, outsourcing companies, things like that. You've got deal size. Where right. You might have be quite sophisticated in a CRM about how many meetings have occurred, things like that. And what I'm finding in these hybrid roles is that really getting the person for the client-facing folks, account managers, consultants, whoever, really focusing on leading indicators are the things that they can actually control and yes. working with the team to identify, hey, given our unique situation and given the merger of the company that we're working on, we need to focus on these things where somebody else might be focused on different things. What are some of the examples you're seeing of the data that people track, maybe on the lagging side, like, like projects, revenue, products sold, and on the leading side, more activities. Our definition, as you know, like things that, that we can 100% control as professionals. Give us some examples. I think starting with, with almost the leading side, which I think is, is become more interesting recently, is really you know who's engaging with our content and how. If we are putting out content into the world in a digital fashion, how do we know who is actually engaging on it? For how long did they just click on it or did they actually scroll through that sort of body of data? What was the topic? What Who was the offer of the thing they actually engaged with? Can be really, really powerful because you can also follow the thread as an individual to say, okay, we're targeting these 10 clients. What are these 10 clients doing to engage with us? Whether it's on a custom microsite, whether it's on our broader website, whether it's on material or content that we've actually sent to them. And how does that influence what we do as a follow-up? So if we know that executive XYZ has, we sent him an email and he was really excited about this. He didn't respond because he was a busy person, but he seemed to spend a lot of time on this particular topic, perusing it himself. What is our next step here? Do we reach out and say, hey, this seemed to resonate with you. We have an expert. Now, you don't want to cross the line into creepy, which is having the... <laughs> Some of these I readings. saw you spend 5.3 minutes <laughs> reading the article. <laughs> ah. exactly. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. There's a way to do it, though. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that can actually be a really, you know, action-oriented insight and data that's interesting to follow that doesn't, you know, you don't have to make too many jumps of assumptions to know if something's going to resonate. It's a little bit more more targeted. Yeah. And no, I agree. Left. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Mo. <laughs> like, what's next? I yeah, there's so much to share. Another thing, one of the one of the teams did, and you may not even know this has happened recently, is they gamified outreach. So given their yeah. unique situation, the pandemic had just occurred, they felt like, gosh, we used to be much better at sort of air quotes walking the halls. We hear that a lot at, at all of our different uh, clients. 
And so what they did is they created a scoring system. And it was so cool. Like if you send an email with a thought piece, it doesn't matter if they open it or not. We just want to incentivize us, you know, making the offer or send, you know, we, we win when we hit send kind of a mantra. And so they get, you get like one point for that. But if you bump into somebody in the hallway, that's five pointer. And then they, they guessed at like how many points the key, the, the top level team could get in a month. So the entire team would win or lose. It was really neat instead of individual. No. Yeah, I thought that was a really cool idea. So what that it did is you you couldn't know if you were going to bump into buddy in in the in the cafeteria or at Starbucks or whatever right outside the the building. But if you're at the building, you got a better chance than if you're at home. And what happened is everybody just went to the client location a lot more. There was one person that had his badge had gotten you know it, it didn't work anymore, but that incentivized him. You know, I've been meaning to get my badge get going again, so I I got that going. So anyway, they blew out their numbers their first two months. And then their reward was have this big team dinner where they sort of blew it out. And they just had fun sharing stories about all the little things that happened. And they're just having fun with it. Like you could just see like the energy and the on the conversation lift up like, yeah, we couldn't believe it. You know, we hit our numbers the first two months. Now we elevate them a little bit for the third month. Can't wait to see if we can do it. So that was a really neat way too. I love that because it really is like, the thesis is almost like, how do you keep going with this stuff? Like once you send your 75th email that doesn't get responded to, or you're just losing a proposal, how do you keep going and stay motivated in different ways? And I love this gamification thing the team did because it really did energize people in a different way that wasn't just like, okay, let's look at who's reached out to who in our in our call to do some public shaming. It was really like, what are we all working towards as a team? And it created like some healthy competition a little bit but everybody's working towards the same goal, which is exactly what everybody's doing, right? It's not sure. a team, it's a team win, it's a team game, whether it's the pro one proposal or whether it's you're your winning the uh, number of outreaches. I think it's the right message to send. Yeah, and what, one of the coolest things about it that was new for me was creating the everybody wins or loses together with the total. We had done it before where individuals would set goals and and that works, it's better than nothing, but I thought it was exceptionally powerful where the whole whole team was in or out, you know, almost like a football team going on the field. You're all going to win or lose together. And it really had that kind of a feeling. What are the things around Cognizant of Time? Any other pro tips around metrics that, that you see successful? Yeah, I think, you know, what I've seen people do is really have basically a one pager with the two or three that matter. And they keep it visible to the team regularly, too. Because I think of the other thing in this role, right? You're focusing on the client, the same role. You're focusing on the client all the time. But also, you can't be the only one who's tracking and thinking about like what insights and that sort of thing. So making the, the metrics themselves visible to the team and having them be something that everybody engages on is really important. It's easy just to throw them up quarterly or shoot them in an email that people don't necessarily respond to, but really put them up in a clean way. And I I know that there are all of these like very cool dashboards popping up on top of the big data sets to try and synthesize it. And I think sometimes those can be super noisy. You know, we're, we're in my my team often they have access to the, the data. And it's so awesome to have it in one place, but they still have to level it up and say, what are the three things I actually want this this group of people to focus on so we can have a good discussion yeah. about it. And so I think that's another important thing to think about. Yeah, I think that's really good. And I'll just finish with this to put a bow on everything we talked about. Folks, engage, talking to the audience, engage with your team and have the team come up with whatever you're going to track. The, the reason for that is every team's in a different place. Have the metrics fall out of whatever your goals are in the strategic part and the process part like we talked about. Some teams need gamification to have more outreach. Some team, teams have plenty of outreach. They need to all focus on offering give to gets because they, they've they already got the relationships. They have to have line of sight to create demand for, for big purchases you want. Like the, the metrics are going to be different every time. So you, A, you want to align them to your goals. B, you want the team to help come up with them because they'll like them a lot more if they came up with them themselves. It takes a little bit, takes a minute to like design these because it's a little, it's not a normal thing you do every day. I guarantee you, you'll have a lot more success if you make them unique, align to the goals and B, have the team co-create it. Really good things happen. Good. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Aaron, it's time for your favorite. The people red. side. I'm a red. This is my favorite one. 
I also think it's just it's like the most nuanced and interesting one to me. Um, I'm also, I can't live in Excel spreadsheets to be uh, transparent with with the world now. Everybody knows. I think it's really the influence, right? It's how, and you've talked about give to gets a lot today. You've talked about them all the time. We use that, that terminology here. But I think it's really how do you influence in this role? How do you influence your team, your account team to act, to buy into your idea, to team well on business development efforts when they're very busy outside of that? It's also for those of folks who are you know, on the front lines, how do you, whether you're in marketing actually, or business development, you're developing an event, or you're actually a partner on the front line selling, how do you influence your clients? And then also, you know, how do you influence your own self sometimes, right? When when your ideas aren't hitting or you're not getting the engagement from the clients, like how do you influence yourself to keep going, whether it's gamification or whether it's finding, you know, what excites you about this type of work. And so I think that's really, that's really critical and where where the right piece comes in. And my team has a book club. My team is, again, fantastic. We have a book club that's run by a couple of books on my team. And the last one we read was The Power of Influence by Dr. Zoe Chance. She's a professor at Yale School of Management. And there's tons of in the book. A couple of things, especially around like the difference between data and influence. You can use data to influence people to some degree. But her research shows that people make decisions and they behave based on their feelings, right? It's the fast thinking part of the brain. And so it's really important that you don't go in with a slide and say like, here's this data, we do this. You really have to think even more about how to influence based on what is this person, what resonates with this person? How does this person seal? What is this person going to say? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't buy this and your argument and really pressure test it. Another thing that she, she also referenced was asking for more. So like give to get to some degree, but like really a principle that you teach, teach quite a bit is how do you ask a client for a favor? And the influence that that creates is just kind of like a small bit of magic that is purely a psychological, sociological thing people don't always feel comfortable with. But how do you really ask other folks for favors to create influence? And I want to say one more thing, and I'll pause, but I think that piece, we think about a role like the role that myself and my team play, it's really important to think about how to use that in this role because my team are individual contributors. They sit alongside their team. They're truly embedded, the you know, senior professionals. And oftentimes it's like, okay, I'm focusing on this account all the time, so I actually just need to be running everything myself. It's easy for me. I'm just going to run everything myself. I'm going to write up this email. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But how do you almost ask the people that you are working with, whether it be your account teams or people eternally, for favors to build up that influence where I think is where you continue to kind of avoid that trap or that label that you talked about at the beginning, Mel, where it's like, okay, I'm like a glorified events professional or glorified admin, or sometimes we call it here bag carrier, where you're just doing everything. But you really need to like build influence with folks and asking for favors is a really critical way to do that in the role. So if they think about the role, that's kind of my, my takeaway. And there's a whole other, you know, school of thought around like how to do this for, for clients and how to think about that and embed it in, in what you do for actual business development activities. But that was something that, that I think I, I've been observing quite a bit over the, the past several years. Well, I think it's really powerful. And in a way, the person that all the folks that report to you, they're modeling the behavior to the folks they serve internally so that the, the client-facing roles do the same thing externally, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to put uh, two resources, everybody, down in the show notes. One is an interview with Mike Daimler. Aaron would know Mike, one of the top trusted advisors in the world. He talks about the best opportunities are the ones that we create ourselves. He's a senior partner, manager, director, senior partner, of BCG. And you just need to watch that whole episode, everybody. So if you want to get thoughts on how to do that externally, that's a great episode. I'm also going to put in the show notes the interview with Dr. Marissa King. She was at Yale. She's now at Penn. She's an expert on social chemistry. And in that episode, she breaks down how do you specifically ask for favors in probably the way Zoe Chance would, would teach as well. But we've got those resources, everybody, that they've been prior guests on the show. We'll put those down below. Both are just all-star, insanely good, every minute has insight in it kind of episodes. So we'll put those down there. Aaron, one of the things that that I think is interesting about asking is a lot of people get themselves in the way on this one. 
well, I don't want to ask for something of someone else. I don't want to put them out. I don't want to. And actually, if, like you, you probably are teaching through Zoe's books. Like it's actually the opposite. When when somebody we ask for a favor or advice, if we want to call it that, whichever, we're actually giving the other person the feeling of being helpful, which is mm-hmm. really powerful for bonding and good for idea flow and everything. Just what are your thoughts around asking and as a way to get more influence and having a bigger impact? Yeah, I think that's great. One thing that I, my own experience with this initially was when I was in business school and anyone who's taken a negotiation class probably have done something similar, which is the nose exercise where your professor is like, go out into the world and ask for things from people. You're going to feel really uncomfortable, but you have to get used to doing it. Whether it's for negotiation where there's a power balance, but ultimately to create influence because, you know, the best negotiations are the friendliest ones, right? The easiest ones. Yep. And so, you know, I'd go out into the world and start small and be like, I'm going to get on the bus and ask him if I can get a free ride, right? And it was always amazing. The more you had to report back with the 10 times that you asked and you actually received a no. And then what were the yeses? And like, what did you earn out of this exercise? And so it was a really interesting exercise to think about it macro, right? Like not even in the context of professional services, business development, but really you really can create influence with with people in your life by asking for favors. And you can't be stingy with your own, of course. But I think that's where the balanced relationship, which ends up having, you know, you end up having much more genuine, authentic conversations with clients. It's really important. And I've seen some really cool things kind of play out in my time here where we might ask a client, you know, hey, we really love it if you could contribute to this panel or this article we're doing. And we know that you're busy and they're like, wonderful, we'll do it. And that's an easy, you know, way to ask for a favor that they also get immediate benefit from. But also things like, you know, can you serve as a reference for me? And there are more challenging things that feel less comfortable to do, but you have to be able to do that. And when folks are like, absolutely, it really strengthens and kind of gradually breaks down some of those gates that exist in in relationships. I love it. So three three practical tips. I love things you can do on a Tuesday idea. Aaron, if you're a leader today, go ask for funding to get a role like what the folks that report to Aaron. <laughs> if you're a client-facing role, go ask your client for advice or help or to be a reference. Just do it. Just try it out. Lightning will not strike you. And if you're a BD professional, go ask the people that you support internally for an elevated impact. Say, hey, I think I could have a bigger impact can we have a conversation about that? I'd like, I got some ideas that I got from this amazing person, Aaron Carlson. So, <laughs> so there's three asks for everybody that listens in. All right, Aaron, do you have time for like the rapid fire questions at the end? Should we sprint to the finish? I and, do. Okay. I do. I'm just going to send a quick note if you don't know. Maybe yeah, 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 I'll yeah. Put it easily edit it out. No, no, no. We keep everything in. This is real life. It's <laughs> funny. <laughs> it's real, real time, real time Slack messaging. That's right. Well, as you're, as you're typing, the question's going to be, what do you do to keep learning? I love it. Okay. It's really challenging. I've tried a lot of things in the past to keep learning. I'm a reader, so I, I do read a lot. But I think what I've always had trouble with is, okay, I'm going to carve out time to learn. So I'll carve out 30 minutes and I'm going to listen to this or I'm going to do that. And for some reason, even though I am I am a fairly disciplined point person and organization is a, is a, a skill set of mine, it's not something that I can practically do. So what I've realized that really boils down for me, the moments that I've learned most are from other people and from working in the trenches with other people. And so this has been one of the things that I've kind of dictated, that has dictated things and choices that I've made throughout my career, which are, am I, am I learning from the people that I'm working with? And what do I need to do to learn more? And how can I learn from these particular people? And I've had some amazing people that I've worked with and learned from, whether it be, you know, those folks on, on account teams that I've worked with, you know, the Mike Daimlers of the world, or the folks on my own team, of course. I'm learning from them so much all of the time. So I think it's the people and learning from the people has been intentional. So, I, you know, not to be too on the nose, I'm actually just making this connection now with the call to action that you brought in the beginning, like, People and talent is so critical for me or for how I personally learn, working with them day to day. So you're really intentional about like, oh, wow, I'm going to be on this project with this person. I want to like, I'm focusing in on how they do X and you're absorbing that in real time. 
Yes. Yes, exactly. And another thing that the second thing in terms of how I learn, it is being very real about who I am and how I show up. So a couple, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I did my maybe second most favorite business development training far behind your own. But it was kind of like a three day session of a pitch training. And there's a lot of filming, right? And I used to do like PR coaching for folks too. It's a lot of filming yourself and seeing yourself in the moment and hearing yourself in the playback. So oftentimes the way I learn at least how to improve or like where my gaps are, are very much in a lot of self-reflection, a lot of actually taping myself on an iPhone, whether it be I'm going to give this presentation to this committee, whether it be, you know, I'm actually trying to make a case for X, Y, Z in my personal life or my professional life. And I just need to hear what I sound like and how I show up. That's been very important to me because I think it's very easy to just kind of get to a point where you're like, I'm really confident. I'm just going to show up in a room and be myself. And you see that on the business development side, right? People have great relationships and they're like, I know this person really well. I'm just going to show up in the room and be myself. I'm sure most of the time that works, but there is also a bit of like, how am I showing up? Where can I be better? So those are kind of two that are maybe just a little bit easier for me to incorporate than being really in the digital to carve out time. Yeah. And just practical tip to the audience, it has never been easier to record yourself. It used to be a big thing. You'd have to go, there's a special day and you have to go to a room and there's big cameras and then you have to get it and you go through this specialized training and that can be super helpful. But these days, everybody, hey, just on your next uh, Zoom meeting, when you meet somebody the first time, that's a scenario that a play that you probably run a lot. Just ask the person, hey, can I record this? And they'll go, oh yeah, sure. Maybe it's for other somebody else or you can just say, I'm going to watch it later for it helps me keep notes or whatever. But then go back and have the guts to watch yourself. A lot of people like say, oh, I don't like to watch myself. Well, of course, none of us do because we don't want to see the, the, why did I say that? But that's where improvement's going to be. So just like, or set up a phone on the side and record yourself or like, just like, it's never been easier to record ourselves like an athlete records themselves on the field and they watch game tape over the, between the, before the next game. You can do that now so easy. It's an unlock. Okay. So what next up, what are the lies, Aaron? I'm so, I've been waiting a dying to ask you this. What are the lies you see people tell themselves that get in their own way? We've covered a couple of here, which is almost like what I'm good at, people embracing what they're good at and what they're not good at and telling themselves repeatedly that that's who they are and that they can't. So especially if you think about this overall, you know, piece of big idea that hard skills are really important and soft skills are important. For those people who aren't inherently excited about developing relationships with people, they'd rather be, you know, the expert in the weeds rolling up their sleeves. They can do well at relationship selling, so to speak, right? They can create those bonds. They have to figure out how and what works. But they can with some hard skills in terms of like, how do you get disciplined around it? So you're focusing on it. And for those people that are almost like, I'm actually really good at this. I, you know, and that might not be a total lie, but I'm good at this and I, it's intrinsic and I can't really get better. I think that's the lie. You can get better and you can get more disciplined and there can always be like incremental value when you have structure, when you have process when you have metrics, and when we have these things that you've talked about, I think that's that's really important to, to think about is just to not dismiss as this is it. It is what it is. And I'll either make the most of it or I'm just not going to do it. Yep. Beautiful. All right. Next up, how do you personally keep going, especially when you have a setback? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. I think for me, it's almost a bit about having a, a short, right, which is in being intentional about disaggregating the setback from the cell. And that can be really hard. And it's something that I remember earlier in my career, like every time that I was just in tears when I would have setbacks or make a mistake, and it was just so consuming. And I, you know, suffered a bit from perfectionism. And I think being able to say like, that's a setback. My self is this and my goal is this. And at the end of the day, I'm obligated to either deliver on X, Y, Z goal, whether I'm obligated to myself or whether I'm obligated to my team and really focusing back on that, it's it's almost easier to keep going when when you kind of take that step back and you're like, okay, maybe I'm not even ready to learn about it yet. 
maybe I'll learn about it in three weeks when I actually feel like I can reflect on it. But I'm just going to take it out because I still have things that I need to do. Aaron, I'm like in all, I, I have this database of turns of phrase that I collect. When I hear somebody say something awesome, I like grab it and I type it up in this little database and then it makes it into my writing or speaking or things like that. Disconnecting the setback from the self that's gold. Like, look at there's, that. <laughs> there's going to be a bit of Aaron Carlson in our next book because I'm like, I can't wait. I'm going to be perusing yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yes, that is so. <laughs> yeah, and you're right. But all jokes aside, like that, like when we have a setback, we I think part of the reason the trauma of it is we then attach that to our identity or something. Oh, I shouldn't. I said this thing, and thus I am not the person I want to be or whatever. But you're right. Like a little mistake or a deal we didn't win or whatever it is, small or big, that doesn't mean it's us. And that's like, it's really cool what you said there. All right, last one. I know you gotta go. We have the super powerful inspirational nudge. Here we go. No one can, no one can anticipate all 10 of these. That's the beauty of it is we're gonna get your raw, raw answers here. All right, well, this is perfect for you. What are the cadences you more personally use to plan, execute, and stay on track. Oh, that's that's great. For me personally, I spend at least 30 minutes a month on planning. I can't do it every week. I can't do it every Sunday night. I just can't do that. But I can spend 30 minutes a, a month on planning. And I think that's that's easy in terms of cadence wise. I also I need to hold, I need to be held accountable, but I know myself enough that I I can't rely on somebody else to hold me accountable. I need to put time on people's calendar. So I always, every, you know, six to eight weeks, I have 45 minutes on my boss's calendar. And they're for my goals. They might, they're professional goals, they're personal goals, but she's a, a great advisor and mentor. And so the function of holding me accountable is just the meetings exist and it's my responsibility to use them well. And then, you know, execution, I think like that's just the meat of it, right? But I do find it really hard especially over the past couple of years, Mel, which is, you know, we live in this Zoom world where it's just meeting after meeting after meeting and how you have a regular cadence for execution. And, and our firm did something really great a couple of years ago, which was like focus Fridays, every Friday after 1 p.m., no meetings. And over time, that's disintegrated a little bit. But I do always try at least once a week to have two hours of focus time because that's when and it's, you know, I do better if it's in the morning because I'm a better morning thinker. But like, as long as I have that to really think critically about whether it's a something with my team or whether it's, you know, something that I, a story that I want to make sure that I'm telling right to, to leadership or I need to dig into a data set. You can't do that between calls. And I think, I think that's a really important thing that I, I try to be disciplined about. Yeah. And I love the alliteration of Focus Friday. I also think Friday is a perfect day for that kind of thing because you're like, you're wrapping things up. Like, this is your me time. This has been absolutely fantastic. Aaron. I want, to, I want to circle back. I want to end with our beginning. Audience, it was amazing that we could have Erin share the kind of things she and her teams are doing. It's the best I've seen in the world at this role. She's always on the lookout for talent. I know there's going to be some people that want to say thank you for this. They're, when I want to con they're going to want to connect with you. They might know of somebody that they want to introduce you to. Where should they go? That's fantastic. You can go right to me, carlson.erin at bcg.com. I'm on LinkedIn, Aaron Carlson. Would love to talk to anyone. I will say also a huge thank you to my team because my colleagues have inspired me and they've inspired so much of the content today. And so that's really essentially what I'm looking for is really people who can contribute with new ideas, who have a point of view to really add to the team and to challenge the thinking that, that we do, that our, our organization does. That is what I love about our team so much is that it's really, we're not trying to be the team that says that's the way we've always done things. We're trying to be the team that questions and brings new ideas, even the craziest ones. Sometimes we get feedback. That's a crazy idea, but I love that you brought it. So that's, that's what we're looking for. Love to talk to anybody who, who fits the profile. I love it. And I just need to add this. I, I also think all of that hundred percent true. I also think that maybe it's in your hiring practices or whatever, there is a thread of intense optimism across your team. Like I'm always uplifted after I meet somebody on your team and we work together, whatever. So like if you will, audience, if you like that kind of thing, I think that's an important element for this role because the whole idea is driving growth. You've got to be optimistic. And Aaron has found those folks in the universe. And I think it really 
it permeates it, uh, you know, all the teams that they support. So Aaron, I had high expectations. You exceeded them. Thanks for being on the show. And thanks for all your prep, like our back and forth and the meetings we had audience. I know it probably seemed like Aaron did this, like, oh, well, I got all these ideas, but she prepped so much for this. And that's why the value was so dense and so intense. So thank you, Aaron. Green, this has been awesome. My green light coming out, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks for being on the show. Such a fantastic opportunity. I appreciate it. You know it. I know it. Or you know it. You know it. Not I know it. All right. (laughs) All right. Thank you.